Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about J.M. Barrie's play, What Every Woman Knows. Now, this is an interesting play because it's in that sort of feminist vein that you get with a lot of modern drama. Um, for instance, with Ibsen's A Doll's House, with uh, Shaw's Mrs. Warren's Profession and plays like this. Where in that sort of late Victorian Edwardian era, this was this was sort of advanced feminist uh, philosophy, uh, advanced feminist sort of um, aesthetics. But today it's a little more complicated, a little more problematic. So basically, what 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 happens with the play? Um, we start with a nouveau riche Scottish family uh, who own a, a granite mine or granite quarry, sorry, uh, called the Wileys. They're pretty rough. They're pretty new to being wealthy. Uh, and as part of their whole nouveau riche middle class thing, they've bought a large number of books. That they don't read. They're not particularly educated. They're not particularly. Um, they're not readers. And what's kind of interesting about that is that they have this great admiration for knowledge. They have this great admiration for education, and yet they make no attempt to pursue it themselves. But when a young student whose family, the Shands, is a sort of rival of the Wileys. Uh, so John Shand uh, is caught breaking into their house at night to study from their collection of books. The Wileys decide to make him a particular offer, namely that they will fund his education to the tune of 300 pounds, which in those days was a massive amount of money, um, they will fund his education if, at the end of five years, he agrees to marry their homely sister, Maggie, if she wants him. So that's the bargain. 300 pounds for his education, and in exchange, if Maggie wants to marry him, he has to do it. John is not initially all that keen on this, but he he, he does eventually agree after it's sort of talked through uh, between him, Maggie, and uh, the brothers and, and father. So that's the premise of the first scene. In the second scene, we find out that John has embarked on his career in politics. Um, and in fact, that he, in his first run, has been elected as an MP. Uh, he, he's been elected to the House of Commons. And so that's where we sort of start out um, in, in terms of the political component of this play. Um, because John, John is elected and then basically immediately uh, during the celebrations, uh, he announces that he's going to marry Maggie. Because that, that's a sort of point of tension of whether he really wants to. He doesn't really want to, but he's contractually obligated to. And she's sort of back and forth on whether or not uh, she wants him if he doesn't want her. But ultimately, she does want to marry John. And so uh, Maggie sort of accepts and John makes the proposal partially out of a sense of duty, which becomes important later on. Um, so that happens. In the third act, we move to London, where John is one of the rising stars of the Liberal Party, in part because he has, he has a knack for rhetoric. He's got these, these powerful political ideas but he's also got these great turns of phrase, these great sort of witticisms or, or humorous 
takes on things, interesting takes on things, that really make his speeches stand out. And so he acquires basically a political patron named Venable, who's a sort of established politician who wants to help him out. And Venable offers him offers John a chance to speak at a big party convention. This would be the speech that would make John's career, and so he accepts it. Now, what's kind of interesting about this is we have this scene there um, where initially... Initially, John, so John is a champion of women's suffrage. Uh, he's, he's a supporter of women's rights. And again, this goes along with that sort of modern drama thing. Um, people like Bernard Shaw are in the same kind of vein. So John is, in Act 3, John is planning to give a speech to the House um, in favor of women's rights. And he, um, sorry, my phone is going off. Um, and so John is planning to give this speech, the gist of which is we need to take up this issue of women's rights, but if it's going to cause too much of a problem, I'll sort of let it go for now, and later on I'll bring it back up. We know that's the gist of the speech because he gives a summation of it to um, the Comtesse de la Briere, who's a sort of French aristocrat who's sort of hanging around on the sort of fringes of the, the English political scene, not really all that interested necessarily, but she's, she's a social player. Uh, so he gives this summary to the Comtesse and to Maggie, who knows, of course, what the speech says because she typed it up. When Venable shows up, he initially meets with Maggie and the Comtesse um, because John is, is otherwise engaged. And Maggie essentially alters the nature of the speech when she describes it to Venable. She says basically that um, in the speech, John is going to say he is pushing forward for women's rights. He doesn't care if it causes the government a problem. He, uh, he believes in this issue and he's going to force their hand. That's the thing that John was concerned that they did not want him to do. So Maggie has now taken a big political risk on John's behalf. And Venable loves it. Venable is like, yes, that is exactly the thing. Uh, that is exactly the thing that we wanted him to do. Um, we were testing him, basically, by, by sort of pressuring him to not take a strong stance on this. He says, uh, Venables says, had he been to hedge, we would have known that he was a pasteboard knight and have disregarded him. So this idea that John is going to stand for his principles, regardless of the consequences, is exactly what the movers and shakers of the Liberal Party wanted to know. So Maggie has basically saved John's career from the thing that he wanted to do, which was to not cause the government much trouble. And the Comtesse starts to suspect that Maggie is, in fact, the driving force behind the success of John's career. Um, and Maggie sort of explains to the Comtesse why she refuses to entertain this idea. Like, she refuses to accept this idea that she is in any way helping John's career because, as she says, he loves to think he does it all himself. That's the way of men. I'm six years older than he is. I'm plain and I have no charm. I shouldn't have let him marry me. I'm trying to make up for it. So there is this self-sacrificial component. But that self-sacrifice becomes really interesting later on because... 
at the in the latter half of Act Three, John has fallen in love with Lady Sybil, who is the Comtesse's niece. Um, Lady Sybil is one of these sort of useless aristocratic socialites whose main sort of function in life is to just look ornamental and lay around. A bit like the women at the beginning of Barry's play, um, The Admirable Crichton. So this sort of lazy, lethargic, languid, but very glamorous woman. So John uh, and Sybil are in love, and I put love in scare quotes for a reason, as you'll see. Um, and so Maggie, who is Scottish, and Scottishness in this play <laughs> equates to practicality, says, all right, let's sit down and we'll figure out what we're going to do. Uh, so initially, John and Sybil basically just want John and, and Maggie to split up immediately, but Maggie's like, well... If you leave me now, the party is not going to let you give your big speech at the convention, and that's the speech that's going to make your career. So what you need to do is make, we'll, we'll leave it until after that speech to announce that we're separating. You need to, in that speech, make yourself so indispensable to the party that they'll overlook a divorce. So, uh, in order to do that with maximum... cushioning, I guess, for everybody's uh, feelings. Maggie suggests that John should go to the Comtesse's uh, cottage in the countryside to work on the speech. They had both been invited, but Maggie's going to make up an excuse, so John is going to go to the cottage. Then, without consulting John or Sybil, Maggie arranges for the Comtesse to invite Sybil as well. Uh, and so that, that's part of Maggie's really cunning plan, because in Act 4, we're at the Comtesse's cottage. A few weeks uh, have gone by. John and Sybil have been there together. And John has started to realize that there's not much to Sybil. And Sybil has started to realize that John is pretty boring. But one of the interesting things... Uh, so we've got a couple of interesting things here going on. One is that Maggie has actually written a letter to John before they left for the cottage, um, telling him not to open it until the end of the stay. But the Comtesse opens it and reads it, uh, after Maggie, because Maggie arrives and John and Sybil are basically like, yeah, we're not that into each other anymore. And so the Comtesse reads this letter. And one of the things it says is, you may ask why I do this, John, and my reason is, I think that after a few weeks of Lady Sib Sybil every day and all day, you will become sick to death of her. I'm also giving her the chance to help you and inspire you with your work so that you may both learn what her help and her inspiration amount to. Of course, if your love is the great, strong passion you think it, then those weeks will make you love her more than ever, and, it, and I can only say goodbye. But if, as I suspect, you don't even know, uh, you don't even now know what true love is, then by the next time we meet, dear John, you will have had enough of her. Your affectionate wife, Maggie. So Maggie has basically set them up, knowing that they are not really in love, that they're just sort of infatuated. Um... And that if she puts, basically she's done that sort of thing that like 50s parents would do when you caught a child with a cigarette where you'd like lock them in a closet and force them to smoke a carton of cigarettes and the premise so that that would put them off smoking. She's, she's put these two people together in a cottage recognizing that they're going to realize how much they don't care for each other um, and that, and that that affair will be over. And it works. It works brilliantly. Um, but the other thing that's happened in at this cottage is that John has written his speech. And Venable has read it. And he's not 
thrilled. It's an okay speech. It's a good speech. The ideas are good, etc., etc., but there's none of the distinctive wit. There's none of the distinctive turn of phrase that made John Shan such a great speaker and the, and the reason that they invited him to give this speech in the first place. But Maggie has brought a revised version of this speech because John had left an early draft at home. And so Maggie had gone through it and added the wit. And she brings that up to the country and the Comtesse gives it to uh, Venables who reads it and he's like, this, this is the speech. This is the, the brilliant version with both the ideas and that sort of sparkling wit. Um, and so John has this sort of revelation that just crushes his fragile male ego that he has not, in fact, done everything in his career by himself. Which is, of course, an absurd notion for him to have anyway, because at the very beginning of the play, in the first act, he gets 300 pounds from the Wileys in order to start advancing his education. So the very notion that he's done everything himself is, is absurd from the beginning. But um, what Maggie basically concludes with is this, it's nothing unusual I've done, John. Every man who's high up loves to think that he has done it all himself, and the wife smiles and let it go at that. It's our only joke. Every woman knows that. So, I mean, this basically the conclusion here is behind every man, every good man is a is a good woman. Um, which, when the play came out, would have been very much a sort of cutting edge feminist statement. The idea that women are, in fact, crucial to men's careers, men's success, would have been a uh, probably even a controversial insight in a way that it today isn't. From the perspective of 2021, things are a little bit more complicated, though, um, in part because this is a very simplistic conception of gender roles. It's a very Victorian, still, conception of gender roles, where this idea of... of the woman as sort of domestic servant, domestic helper to her man. Um, Charles Dickens's phrase, the ministering angel of domestic bliss. But we've also got like Sarah Stickney Ellis, who was this sort of early Victorian social commentator who basically argued that women's proper role in the world was to be a positive moral influence on their men. This is this is problematic in that it's a very limiting role for women. It's a very constricting role because it allows no public ness, no public uh, position for women. They're to remain in the house and exert moral influence over their men who go out and and exist in the public sphere. So this is in in the era of sort of post second wave feminism um the the 60s and 70s movement that sort of asserted women's equality and right to uh have jobs participate in politics uh participate in business etc cetera, etc cetera. this is a little more problematic this idea of women's moral influence in the home as a woman's primary social responsibility.